Hello, this is uh, Moze, hello, <laughs> Jacob, <laughs> for the Bar as Spoken Word, and this is part of our series for the 18th of September 2020, a momentous year, uh, part of what we are offering for Culture Night across Ireland, and I am here with Kay, Kim, and um, well, she may explain about her name okay. later but we she lives in Cork and I live in West Cork and we've met before and I didn't really know that she was also a storyteller I knew that she is very interested in nature and I, you also do martial arts is that correct Kim? yeah you oh. could see um, some of my equipment back in in there yes I do um, I do I teach uh, traditional Shaolin Kung Fu Okay. um in its entirety so um as you can see there's some some of the equipment in the background uh from that looks um, impressive yeah the, um it's i i well i um i guess maybe i'm used to it so i don't see it as like wow but well i guess i do uh see because i am still really fascinated with the whole uh martial arts and um uh, traditional martial arts in Shaolin and its history and its background and all the things that it's gone through um, at the same time. But then when I look at, um, to me, that just looks like, oh, this is my um, classroom equipment. This is what I have to use for this seminar and that seminar. Um, so I kind of forget uh, that's one of, it's great for you to hear that other people find it impressive because it reminds me of how, um, how rare or intricate um this is like each one of those swords back there and i have another set up over on the other each one of them has a story to tell yeah. you know like yeah. all the way from the double-edged swords these are that's a shingy double-edged ones they have a whole story and a history of how they came about and why they um why they're made the way they are and what they're used for and everything so um and I could go on for years and years and talk about each and every single one of them. Well, you could uh, have a whole YouTube series about it. So Especially more, the double-edged yeah. double sword. That's a really... Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's, exactly, that's exactly what those are, double-edged swords. Or sometimes what they call a proper sword. Um, but it, we won't get into that. that that's a whole other story. <laughs> is, is it, it, it is a Chinese tradition? Shaolin is a, tri a Chinese tradition. Um, uh, uh, Shaolin um, was developed nearly 2,000 years ago. Um, and it, it's an interesting thing. It was the very basis of Shaolin actually came up from India because okay. they even had their own martial arts. I forgot the name of it, and I'm sorry, um, that only like the King's Guards knew in it. Um, but um, the it Damo or Bodhidharma or Daruma has a couple of different names. Actually, brought up he was a meditation master. The monks um, in the Honan Temple um, heard about him and said, uh, "Hey, why don't you come up and teach us how to meditate?" And uh, so Damo said, okay, sure, you know, and took nine months and went all the way up to the Honan Temple and uh, said, okay, here I am. When does class start? Um, and so I guess the first day of class, uh, Damo goes out there to his class to teach the meditation and all the students fell asleep in class, okay? So he got really upset <laughs> and he went away, um, went up into a cave somewhere and sat down and hid out into a cave. The monks said, hey, you know, we need to get this guy back. Um, so they sent two of the monks up to go find him and they found him in this cave, you know, meditating, staring at a wall and they were begging him to come back. And he said, no, no, you guys, you fall in sleeping class um, and stuff like that. You're not interested. And so one of the monks said, okay, to tell you how sincere we are, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rip off my right arm uh, to show you. So he rips off his right arm. And then uh, Dama goes, oh, okay, all right, I'll come back. You know, it looks like you're serious enough. I'll come back. You pick up your arm, take it along. We'll figure it out when we get down there. So um, he comes, uh, Damo gets back. He pulls an all-nighter and he creates this thing called the 49 I Ching Ching Postures. Okay, they're yoga-like, they're based off of yoga, 
and he um, gets the monks up at like sunrise or even earlier and starts teaching them um, these 49 each and ching postures so that they could stay awake during class. Okay, <laughs> so the whole, so I always have to laugh and to think that the whole of the Shaolin art was probably created because um, monks fell asleep in class. <laughs> so this whole dangerous martial arts was created because of this, uh, because yeah, they fell asleep and they couldn't stay awake. So <laughs> that's what, but the interesting thing is that when you see a lot of the monks, I'm gonna have to stand up here. You'll see they'll have the left hand out like this and they have the bottom hand like this. Okay. Okay, as okay. they bow. Um, or sometimes they'll have their right hand behind their back and they'll be doing this and they'll bow with their left hand out in front. That's actually to honor that one monk that tore off his arm. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so this is all with the left hand of doing this is uh, part of it is to honor that monk who tore off his arm and made that sacrifice so that Dhamma would come back and teach them, um, teach him meditation and I Ching Ching and whatnot. Thank you. <laughs> What Sorry, I, I, I go on. <laughs> I babble. So No, this was a story. It's a full story. <laughs> what, what is your connection? Because I know you you're grew up in the States, were born in the States, but you have a, an Asian background to start with? I actually, I was born in Vietnam. Oh, I was born okay. in Vietnam in 1971 towards the end of the Vietnam War. Oh, wow. and, um, and my dad, my father, he actually went back and found the right kid. Um, on that, and there's again a whole like uh, mini series or mini documentary about all those trials and stuff. But he managed to find the right kid because there was a lot of paternity tests. Wait a minute, and were, you, were you the kid? Huh? Were you the child? He, he yeah, so he went right... back. Oh, you're, and you're, he... you're American, you have an American father. Oh, yeah. No. yeah, so um, okay. as I said, he went back and he found. The right kid. Matter of fact, because he he basically kind of um, in a sense snuck back to Vietnam after he found out that I was there. And um, now again, that's a whole big story, and I think we only have 15 minutes. <laughs> so, but um, he actually started. He spearheaded the um, the program uh, that allowed. Um, at what at the time they called them Amerasian kids um, to be brought to the United States as U.S. citizens because we're not um, because our we were we're naturally born citizens um, provided that they come over with I mean there's some guidelines that there had to be a paternity test so that it'll prove that you know their father was um, an American citizen. They had to bring the, um, the mother over as well, but they didn't do any maternity tests. And there's another whole story to it too. But um, you, went, to you went with your mother. You, you and your mother came over. Yeah, well, they, my, my dad went and got us and brought us over. Okay. Um, and so he spearheaded the whole program and I was in a sense the first one to come oh. to the U.S. As a, as a U.S. citizen, you know, um, yeah. from that one of the first children, because before that, they were, it, it was a tough uh, type of thing, and again, a whole documentary based on it, um, about what they call the children of the dust, because Amerasian kids in, in Vietnam a lot of times were left on doorsteps. Um, they called them children of the dust because they were they weren't it. Um, they weren't worth the dust on your shoes. Wow. is what they were called. So wow. they were left. That's so um, they were left on doorsteps and everything because uh, the American fathers didn't come back for them, and they were obviously um, mixed race. Um, there was a whole set of time when um, American counselors and stuff came over and started gathering up all the Amerasian children to bring to the U.S. to get adopted out. So there's some, there's a, a movie that kind of goes over that a little bit called The Daughter of the Nang. Um, and so th that goes over what, I mean, there was hundreds of Amerasian kids that were shipped out to, um, to the U.S. to grow up as 
Americans or to be adopted out. Um, there were like plane crashes and everything. So a lot of them died too. Wow. Uh, so it's like a, a <laughs> okay. We, we, the reason that so, I, I, I somehow ended up with, with ended up with you, that sounds derogatory, but I, I, that I realized that apart, because I know you as a nature activist through Core oh, yeah. Network. So then I suddenly thought, oh, may, maybe because I, w I was really looking also for a bit of a uh, Native American perspective, because I think, you know, the, 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 the theme of this series is how nature nourishes us. And I think that there is indigenous knowledge, not just in America, but also in Australia, for example, and even in Ireland, about a different relationship with nature. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, uh, different from the West, which is sort of like a plunder and rape nature and then destroy it. <laughs> you no, know, that's why we're in a bit of a pickle. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. and then I asked you, did you have any Native American forebears? And you said, yes, I happen to have some. Mm -hmm. And could you tell us about this? And because you also said you had a really nice story to do with grass. I have, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of a lot of different stories about that so I just wanted to be clear is that I did take the test the 23 and me type of thing it turned um, family history and family what they would say family folklore actually um, would uh, suggest that I'm uh, a descendant of a tribe called the fox and um, Sock and Fox tribe, and they're up in like uh, northern Michigan, Canada, Midwestern type of tribe. If you look up things like uh, Chief Sparrowhawk, um, that's that same tribe um, from there, maybe a little Potawatomi put into it. But I want to make it very clear because of the way they were discriminated against in our family, in the Eastman family tree, um, they, any, any of the Native Americans were scrubbed out or not even put in. And there's a lot of holes in the tree that would suggest that that, that was the, the case. So in a way, I couldn't necessarily prove um, that part because there were too many holes in the family tree. And it took <laughs> science later on to, to prove it. So I never got, well, I didn't pursue a tribal number or a tribal affiliation. Being that I was already considered a minority, there wasn't really... I, I don't want to sound disrespectful. There wasn't any need to get a minority status or anything like that. And whenever I traveled in the US, I would go reservation hopping. I would go from one reservation just because of discrimination and, and there's a whole bunch of other stories there. Um, I was much, I was more accepted on the reservations than I were if I was staying in a hotel in some of these places that whenever I was traveling in the US. So I never, felt that I needed to get or pursue that tribal affiliation or tribal number um, on that. So I just want to be respectful of everything that, that even though the 23andMe says that I'm a part Native American, I've, um, I don't have the affiliation, I don't have a tribal number or a tribal ID, but I have loads of stories and I have loads of experience and and um, especially in my times at, on spending, I spent a lot of times on different reservations throughout the US, mostly the Western part of, of the US. What about um, your father? Was, was, I mean, were you in contact with him? Could he tell stories? Could he tell about your, my, your background, your ancestral background? Not, not so much. My dad was, um, uh, you know, he was in the Air Force. He was Air Force enlisted. He's from the Midwest and he was, again, very detached from a lot of those things. It, and it was me, because I was a precocious little kid that pursued it on my own. And I talked to a lot of people. I'll be, um, in I grew up in Colorado, so I would see like either Native Americans or even um, other Asians or Vietnamese. And I, I, would sit, I would just go and ask them questions. and. Um, and then they would tell me stories and I remember the stories because I am a sucker for a story. You know, you tell me a story and I'm yours and uh, type of thing. So I, I got to go and I, when I started learning to drive, I would just take off on the weekends and I would end up on a reservation or something. I would talk to them and learn from them and they taught me how to do things like churn butter or um, um, 
bake corn in the ground or these kind of things. And so I just took it all in um, from that. So unfortunately, yeah, my dad was very detached. He was, um, you know, enlisted Air Force and he, when he retired, he just kind of went away. I mean, you know, so that's, that's, uh, that's fine. You know, that's what his story is. And I have a different one. Yes, <laughs> you have many different ones. So I have a different can you tell us the story that you, that you mentioned to me about this, the I, It, it kind of goes uh, in terms of like how uh, you, your theme about how nature nourishes you. There's one thing that I think that we always forget when we think about nature and about nourishment and stuff, we think about nature as in plants, trees, bugs, animals and stuff that we kind of forget some of the other elements within nature um and how those things could help i mean okay we we kind of understand rain you know water that kind of comes from the sky and such like that but what i'm what i'm thinking is like the one that i think everybody forgets about because it's just air is the whole um wind and air uh from that and um like over in colorado that i grew up there's the pawnee national grasslands now, when I was a kid, it's not like this anymore. Unfortunately, it's not like this anymore because of, um, sorry, I'll put this in, uh, I'll just put a little tag here, because of the climate change, because of developments and everything like that, the Pawnee National Grasslands is caught smaller and smaller and the grass doesn't grow as high as it used to. When I was a kid, we would go to the Pawnee National Grass. You would go to the Pawnee National Grasslands and you would have grasses that were as tall as you were, like five feet tall, just natural grasses all along. And they would just sway in the sweet smell if it rained and everything it was amazing um, if you could get out into the middle of it. And um, one of the neat things with the Pawnee um, tribe is they have these things called grass dancers. And, um, and again, with the engine, when you, you can look it up, just put Pawnee National, um, sorry, Pawnee Grass Dancers, and you will see they have like these big, they used to have, um, they were used to take, make outfits out of this tall grass. So when they dance, the, the, um, the grass just kind of uh, in their regalia would just flow in patterns and stuff. Um, but look up a YouTube video on it. It's really beautiful type of thing. And so the bit of folklore, the little bit of folklore that I have with the, uh, with the Pawnee grass dancers is that they were the ones, what they would do is they would talk to the grass. They would uh, talk to the grass that when they were traveling through it, they would ask the grass to lay flat. Um, let's see, they would ask the grass to lay flat so that to give them a path to wherever it was that they were golden, going. And then once they, um, once they were going along that path, that behind them, the grass would stand back up so they couldn't be tracked anywhere. Um, so it, it was, so they would do these dances to ask the grass to help them out when they navigated through the, these grasslands and to find the way to find the water. So they would talk to the grass in that, manner. Now getting um, back to the wind is that they also believe that um, the wind carries messages. So that's one thing you think. So the winds carry the messages. The wind will carry the messages and tell the grass. And so the grass dancers and even some of the elders in the Pawnee, they would interpret the wind, how the wind moved the grass to get messages from different parts of different tribes or different places or from from the after or from the other worlds um uh you know these sort of things so it was really neat when you uh one thing i would really suggest that if you do go out into a meadow or anything like that listen to the wind and look at the grass and see what kind of patterns and things and maybe it might be telling you something it might be giving you i mean i i'm a skeptic when it comes to a lot of like um you know afterlife previous lives or anything like that but what i kind of believe that there's things right here in front of you that you um it doesn't have to be anything grand or anything like that but listening to the wind and watching the grass move and just watching how things move and everything like that could be um 
I don't know, meditative. It could be a lot of different things. Information? Information. Um, it might help you figure something out. Um, when I was a kid, and again, nobody really told me about this, but um, I, I, as I said before, I was a precocious, yeah. precocious little kid. And I was also very odd. I have a lot of, um, back then they call it um, uh, learning disabilities. Then they called it learning differences. And now they have, I don't know what they call it now. I mean, I was dyslexic. I have a processing speed deficit. Really? I have a whole bunch of other th things uh, going on. And so it was a very obvious, not only was I racially ambiguous, um, but I, w I thought of and I saw things very differently than the rest of the kids. So when I was a kid, uh, very young, whenever, you know, when, uh, when, there, when it's a windy night, um, you can hear your windows hum, you hear the doors knocking, things kind of rattle around, where I think everybody else would be just, kind of, especially if you're a kid, would get scared. I was fascinated by this. I actually believed that they, I called them the wind people, okay? And that they were just wanting to come inside, okay? So <laughs> what I used to do as a kid, whenever the wind started kicking up or a storm would come on, and this could be in the dead of winter too. So I'd go through and open every single window and every single door in the house, okay? And let them come in. My dad would go around and close all the doors and stuff. And then you hear this knocking and then I would get really upset. Like, by God, they just want it. That's why they're moaning. That's why they're crying outside is because they just want to come in. It's cold outside. Let them in. <laughs> so I'd go. Back and so this was like a, a, a power struggle between me and my dad, uh, my dad. So my dad, can you imagine your five-year-old is going around opening up the windows and screaming at you about letting them in. And then he has to go around and close them. There's one thing I got to give him. He never disciplined me for doing it. He just went back and closed all the windows and stuff. And then I would open them all back up. Um, but um, going back to that thing is just like, um, maybe it's something like we have to even watch the kids. Maybe the kids are, um, I see it so much in our kids, even though I don't have any, is that, um, they, you let them outside into the woods or something like that, and they're sitting there talking to the trees, or they talk to the flowers, and they like listen to the winds and stuff like that. But maybe it wouldn't be so bad for us to listen to what the kids are saying about this and that, because I think that maybe they have a little bit of knowledge that maybe we've forgotten about, about how nature works, I guess, and such. Because I, I mean, I've heard kids tell like, amazing stories about blades of grass and and flowers and ladybugs and how the relationship I, I don't know it's it's just crazy if you just sit and listen to them um they come up i don't know if they come up with the great stories but you know you could uh let it go a little bit that maybe they're actually learning something from well, from um these bugs go coincidentally this morning i shared the post and it was about how Lego, you know, Lego, the, the plastic bricks, the, the plastic. Oh, Legos, yeah. Lego, yeah, we call it Lego too. Uh -huh. so pronounce it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> how they are changing, they, they've been getting so many letters from kids asking them not to, to uh, put little uh, single use plastic bags around it and to stop using plastic oh, actually. Yeah. So they're now too slowly, but they are slowly changing. Perhaps, you know, we were suggesting maybe they can use hemp or something else for the Lego. Oh, yeah. The kids' letters, it said in the article, that is driving wow. the change. So, you know, I think you're dead right. You yes. should be listening to kids. <laughs> they got it. I know. I, I think that's, um, I think maybe as adults, we kind of forget a lot about those innocence and, and uh, things that uh, um, there's a certain logic or understanding I think that maybe young people have almost innately sometimes um, that because of life and the stresses of fitting in and doing this that it, it, it kind of forget about it we yeah. you know we forget mm -hmm. that um, you know if uh, you know if if something smells sweet on the wind that it not, might be coming from this direction or you know th these or, you know, if we see a ladybug without any spots, that it might be a, 
first, you, just a lot of little, little stories. Yeah. I mean, again, I got to be careful because I could go on forever about any one of these uh, types of things. Um, but can you, can you, with the, huh? No, can you tell us as a, as a last sort of uh, oh, yeah. round, not round up, uh, ending, what you're doing in Cork at the moment to do with, in Cork City, to do with nature? Yourself? yourself? There's, I have a few projects. Now I have, I don't, as again, I don't know if I could call it a group. It's more like, it's me. Um, and it's uh, on Facebook, you can hear it. It's called Brusker Crow. And the whole idea of Brusker Crow is that um, I, I for one, and I'm sorry, I, I'm going to sound a little harsh here, is that I got a bit fed up with going to the same, to all these meetings and all these things, and it was the same people that would show up, and they would all talk about how bad this is and how bad this is, and that we should do this and we should do this, and then nothing ever really got done. Okay, and that we, they all patted themselves on the back and said, you know, we're great environmentalists, and then they would take off, and then they would have another meeting. Okay, <laughs> um, so I went rogue, and I started this thing called Brusker Crow um, last September. Unfortunately, this year we got caught with the COVID. Yes. Or I should say we, I did. Um, but before um, Brusker Crow, we started up um, with Brusker Crow and with the help of uh, Cork Community Art Link, we started the Cork Repair Cafe at the beginning of this year. Um, uh, these things got stuck on hold. Um, there is, um, we called it the Strawberry Rogue, or I should say I did, or Lillian's back, uh, Lillian's Garden Initiative is that we are trying to elicit um, um, like the elderly who can no longer take care of their gardens anymore that uh, we could go in there and make it a, a natural, um, like a meadow or a wildflower garden or something like that. So it's low maintenance, they don't have to maintain it. And they could just let uh, like a bee garden or a butterfly garden, just let wildflowers grow in their back gardens. Um, again, that got put on hold. There's a few semi gorilla gardening projects around, um, like the Crook de Moor pathway. We're trying to get flowers and things growing along there instead of just um, craggy kind of uh, weeds uh, going there. And the big one that's what is right now um, I'm trying to get together is um, we've been working on it for a while um, since um, the beginning, very beginning of the year. Um, but again, we got shut down because of the COVID is what we call the lockdown garden over at the Lock Community Center. There's a green on the side. And so we're uh, with the helps of Green Spaces for Health. Um, and um, we're trying to get big garden boxes put in there. We could probably fit five, six foot by three feet high and a meter wide boxes out there all to grow vegetables and things for the community and for the Meals on Wheels that are up over at the Lock Community Center as well. So um, those were the main projects, but like I said, a lot of the stuff gets uh, got caught Put on hold yeah. because of COVID and, and the time of year as well. And at the same time, with the Facebook page that I'm in, I'm going around trying to do comparative shopping just to show um, people that, you know, it's, a, it's, there's a lot of myths about um, going green and about doing recycling and everything. So I want to kind of dispel a lot of those myths, like, you know, that it's actually cheaper to go um, and refill cleaning products other than keeping, uh, buying new ones. It's better, um, and it's, it's, um, you get cheaper and better quality if you buy, uh, clothes from a charity shop or a reused type of clothes. And so I wanted, I do a lot of what I call crow shopping and do a comparison. So I post those things up on online so that, uh, to dispel all the myths of, um, of going green and also to try to get away from that whole environment. Uh, you know, a lot of times people get sick and tired of the words environmental and upside. Uh, more I lost, common way I of lost living. there just a minute. Yeah, go on. Oh, so um, you're a little bit frozen there, but um, yeah. so it's, as I said, it's, it's trying to, the Brusker Crow is just trying to bring, there was a time before plastic 
before all of this stuff that we got along just fine. And, um, and I, so a lot of Brusker Crow is kind of bringing people back to that idea that things are, might actually be more convenient. It could be cheaper and easier to do without all of this other stuff that's, you know, out there. Um, and I guess what, as I said, I'm trying to bring sexy back to common sense, you know, so I'm sorry, I'm going on now again. <laughs> more, no, that's more. Okay. Thank, we will put some details for you underneath the, um, underneath the video. Thank you okay. very much for now. And I look oh, forward to thank you. hearing more stories. Thank you very much, Kate. <laughs> okay. All right.